Hello everyone, uh, welcome to another UTA Planetarium live star stream. I'm uh, Levant Kurdemir, UTA astrophysicist, and today we are going to answer some more questions. And especially, uh, we'll take a look at the night sky and what's going on uh, this evening. So, uh, over the week uh, we received some of the questions. Some of them are related to Mars and some of them are related to the night sky. And, uh, and Jim Bader here with me. Uh, uh, and I think the next is going to be uh, what's going on in the night sky. So what do you prepared for us, Jim? All right, so I, I, I prepared a few things for you, but uh, um, uh, hello, Brexton. Uh, Hi, nice Brexton. see you here every time. Your number one supporter, grateful. Great. Um, I think I think we just want to talk about what's going on in the sky first, and then we'll move on from there. So, um, yeah, without further ado, let's let's go ahead and um, send you to look at the sky. All right. So let's take a look at the sky in the evening. Uh, so there's a great uh, star show uh, in the evenings because there are great pattern of stars are visible in the sky. So this is uh, approximately the, if you look at the south direction, you would see plenty of bright stars. And uh, those bright stars make up a constellation. So what's a constellation? Just pattern of stars. So we just imagine lines between bright stars and uh, on, on this one, on this area, if we draw lines, it will make a shape. And it was a uh, Greek astronomer's imagination that that shape is, it looked like a hunter, a hunting man. And they called it Orion. Orion uh, is one of the, the, the most noticeable constellations. And here is actual the actual Orion. And here is shiny belt. Three bright stars are forming the shiny belt of Orion. And there is a star called Rigel over here, which means foot. And there is another star called over here, Betelgeuse. And it is uh, actually, it means armpit. And from Orion constellation, you can find the brightest star of the night sky. And here is how. So you need to use the, the belt stars of Orion. Those are uh, three stars in line. And you just need to draw a line right over here all the way. And here is the, the brightest star of the night sky, which is Sirius. So uh, yes, the, the brightest star in the night sky is called Sirius. Uh, so that very name serious business you're talking about. <laughs> very serious. So it is not the serious, the word serious, serious. You know, it is pronounced differently. And you remember this from actually, a, 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 if you are using a satellite radio, uh, there is a, a famous uh, satellite radio provider after uh, that name, right? And it is located in a different constellation called um, Canis Major. Uh, so you can guess what Canis Major means, right? Uh, it means everything. Uh, so Canis Major is a big dog. Canis is a dog and Major is big. Well, if there is something named in the sky... I, I have to interrupt you because of how ridiculous this looks. So just, just for everybody watching this, whether you're watching it live or you're going to watch it later on, um, that's supposed to be a dog right next to the vent there. Um, not sure what it... I, I don't. I mean, it doesn't look like any dog. I, I Levent, do you, does it look like a dog? Do you see a dog in that picture? I don't see one. Well, kind of. I mean, uh, it depends on who <laughs> draws it. You I know, guess the, you're the, right. I know, like, my drawing skills are horrible. I cannot draw anything, but uh, some people can do great drawings. And this one, I don't know. I think it's okay drawing. I didn't draw this. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll accept it. Don't but, blame uh, me if it doesn't look like it anything. Looks but some kind of like uh, goat, jaguar, cat, sheep. I don't know. I don't see a dog super well, but it's supposed to be a dog if you don't agree. After the next constellation I'm going to show you, you will be okay with this, okay? Because, okay, you can argue <laughs> it, is, it looks like a dog or not. But, you know, what was the name of this constellation? 
Canis major. Canis major. So if there is a major one, so that means there is a minor version too. Otherwise, we would just call it Canis or dog. So uh, where is the little dog? Well, it turns out it's right over here. The little dog constellation, it only has two, yes, uh, two stars. So if we uh, construct the constellation out of this, uh, and it just makes a line. So why they called it little dog then? Because it doesn't look like a dog. Well, we need to put artwork over here to make it a dog. But to me, it just doesn't look like a dog. It looks like a hot dog <laughs> in the sky. Definitely. All right, so Kurt, uh, hi, it's, uh, he says, doesn't the North Star alternate every 23,000 years or so? Yes, it does. Uh, well, it doesn't alternate, but it actually, um, uh, the, 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 the North Star changes. The North Star, uh, as we call Polaris, is the North Star of today. So to see this, let's go into the North direction. So in the North direction, we'll find the North Star, but it is not obvious. You cannot just, I mean, one cannot usually look at the sky and point the North Star directly. Even I'm an uh, astronomer for uh, decades for myself, I need to use a different constellation to find North Star, and it is right over here called Big Dipper. So the seven bright stars, if you draw the lines, it makes a, uh, it looks like a spoon called Big Dipper and use the top stars of the Big Dipper called guide stars. And those guide stars are, uh, if you just do star hopping, draw a line, takes you all the way to the North Star right here. So this is the North Star. Now, as you see, it is not a bright star. It is very dim star. It is located in Little Dipper constellation, if you know the exact location of the Little Dipper. So here is the Little Dipper, and at the end of the, the Little Dipper, at the tail of the Little Dipper, there is the North Star. So I want to pop in and just, just remind everybody, if you're watching, this is accurate to what you should be able to see in Arlington. Um, obviously, if you live near the buildings or the bright lights, or you got some big lights, you're going to see a little bit less. And maybe if you have a nice dark clearing, you, you might see more, but probably not. Um, so as you can see with the, the little dipper that he pointed out, you, you can see really just Polaris or the North Star and you can barely see that. But I'll let you get back to what you're doing, Levant, sorry. Sure. <laughs> and Brexton says, how many decades, Levant? Yeah, uh, two decades. <laughs> I have been an astronomer. <laughs> uh, may, maybe not the long, but uh, I think uh, the 20 years, uh, whole 20 years. So North Star, the Polaris, uh, is the North Star. It points us the North direction uh, and uh, finding the, the directions is easy. But if we go back into the history, so we don't, we cannot go all the way back, but we can go back as much as uh, 5,000 years. And uh, Jim, can you show me the, the precession circle so we can see how it looked, how the sky yes, looked 5,000 years ago. The North Star was not this star 5,000 years ago. Uh, well, if you look at the, the documentaries of the, the pyramids in Egypt, you may hear the word that some of the holes were lined up with the North Star. They are talking about different stars. They are to not talking about uh, Polaris. So because the things were different 5,000 years ago. And, uh, uh, and because the things were different, uh, the, the, uh, the North Star, the North Stars, uh, the, or different star was North Star. North Star's location was not different, but it was different North Star. So uh, the star Thuban uh, in the, the Draco constellation, uh, which is uh, also uh, can be found using the, the, the Big Dipper, and I will try to, I will do my best to show it. So there's a, another dim constellation going between the Big Dipper and Little Dipper. And, you know, we use these stars as guide stars to find Polaris. And this time, coincidentally, we are using the bottom guide stars to find all the way here to find the star Thuban. So that star Thuban was the North Star to ancient Egyptians who built pyramids 5,000 years ago. So here is the five minus 5,000 marker over here. So this path shows the, the change in the, uh, the North Star, or what we call it North Celestial Point, uh, by time. So after 5,000 years, it 
comes over here, it is very close to this star Polaris. So how about in the future? If we go in the future, 5,000 years, the location of the North Star will be here, and we don't see below, but after 10,000 years, there is another bright star in the, uh, the, the sky called Vega. Vega is going to be considered as North Star. So why this is all happening? Because the Earth's spin axis wobbles in space and that wobble is represented by this circle we call it precession circle and yes nearly the one period of the circle is about 27,000 years so if we lived that long after 27,000 years we will just uh, see the whole cycle of changing uh, north stars and the, the north star as of today polaris will be back again the north star after 27,000 years Great questions. Um, there is some, I think, uh, the horoscope uh, conversation going on in the chat. I'm a Sagittarius, uh, I think. No, you are not Sagittarius. Uh, who said that? What, what would they actually be? Hold on. It would be... Dinah? Yeah, it looks like if they were a Sagittarius, I'm going to go on a limb and guess that they're... They, they, might, they might be a... Um, Ophiuchus, it's possible. Uh, could be. Uh, you know, everything is linked to that North Star change. So, um, uh, Dal Dina, if you tell us your birthday, uh, we can tell you uh, what your sign is, uh, if you're interested. But here is, if you, Jim, can show uh, all the, the horoscope, the, the, not the horoscope, the <laughs> zodiac constellations to us. Uh, so, the North horoscope Star changes. Not the horoscope constellations I would like to see. I would like to see <laughs> zodiac constellations, <laughs> right? So uh, I'm, not, I'm not reading horoscopes over here. So some of the, the changes with the, the related to this change, this, the North Star change, of course, shifts everything in the sky because the reference point changes. So what's the purpose of uh, the, the zodiac constellations here we see? So, um, uh, as you see, uh, these constellations are, uh, well, if you are looking from flat screen, they are on a line. And if you are in the planetarium or the actual sky, they are on an arc. Uh, and with the complete sky, they are on a circle. So what is that circle? That circle is actually the, the apparent path of the sun. Because uh, the astronomers, even like uh, 5,000 years ago and even uh, more than that, they realized the sun just, just doesn't appear in the sky in random, uh, random points. Uh, so they realized that the sun appears in the sky on this path. And also the moon and the planets of the solar system, they, they knew what the planet was. That's, what, that's why they call it planet. Planet means wonder. Uh, so they were appearing on this path. So they called it, so that path is special. And there are 12 constellations they identified on that path. So they identified 12 constellations. Hmm? I'm yeah. switching it to daytime so they can see the position of the sun here in yeah. this. And they'll kind of be able to get an idea. It'll take mm -hmm. a, obviously we started an hour after. Mm -hmm. um, but there we can see the sun. So there are 12 constellations. That means there are 12, like 12 reminds you what? The, the the how many months in a calendar year so because we are using 12 month based calendar because there are 12 constellations on this zodiac belt so uh, of course uh, well you give for any given date you can identify the location uh, this is an address system if you uh, would like me to come to your address you need to tell me the street number and uh, street name so Looks I can like find Dina you. gave us street number and street name for what her sign might be. Uh, well, if you are telling me uh, something in the sky, you need to give me an address. And that is the constellation. So that's why um, the, the one thing beca became, uh, you know, not important, but uh, an address system. And that's like, where was the sun at your birthday? And you can, uh, well, to with the today's... Uh, great software you can uh, find out where the, the sun was 
and uh, what's like is it Pisces right is it in the boundary y of Pisces I think it's uh, sh I'll turn the boundaries on give me just a moment okay so um, uh, we can tell uh, at the time you were born precisely yes. uh, what was the Sun's position so this is actually what uh, the horoscope takes the information from and there are like the date ranges and then there is a sign associated with your birthday which is again astronomically and astrophysically it's not important thing well uh, I have to cut in this is really important and also uh, super exciting so um, uh, I, I hope I'm saying your name right Dinah uh, I, I, if I'm not please forgive me but um, your birthday is 1216 and maybe if you went on the internet and looked it up, it would say that you're a Sagittarius. I, th I think that I saw that up there above. But your birthday is perfect for us to talk about procession. Absolutely perfect. Uh, we obviously don't have time to go through everybody's, but um, Levent, you can see where December is right there, right dead center, if you want to point to it. That's about December 16th, um, right there. and. You can notice there's no constellation there. You're between Scorpius the Scorpion and Sagittarius the Centaur. Um, and that's because you're actually in the foot of a constellation called Ophiuchus. So please let me um, activate Ophiuchus for you. Yeah, you know, we said uh, there are 12 constellations along that path. There's actually 13, but the 13 is so narrow and not taking a lot of space, so that <laughs> constellation was considered part of Scorpius right over here. So, I mean, according to the, the, this consideration, you can be Scorpius or uh, Ophiacus, uh, as Jim said, uh, yeah. if you consider the 13th constellation in this, but not different to Sagittarius. So, but uh, where that Sagittarius uh, is coming from in the, in the any horoscope news you see, uh, that's another story. 5,000 years ago, uh, the, the scale and the, the, the location, the placement of the constellations uh, were shifted and in different location and, 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 and then the, the, the horoscope dates were correct 5,000 years ago. And how about now? The things change. The, the, because of the precession motion, the North Star's location changed and this address system is also shifted by one month and made everything wrong in the horoscope and for that reason if you look up your actual uh, the Sun's position it's not gonna be in the uh, the constellation that you wish for so Kurt says I'm a Gemini so I am no sir uh, unfortunately <laughs> not <laughs> Well, again, it doesn't matter. I mean, this is uh, the, the another is, another. Is uh, he trying to make a joke about being a twin? Another thing about horoscope is uh, how come this address system is uh, somehow connected <laughs> with your personality, with your future, with your everything. So it it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I know a lot of people are mad at me already. Uh, because uh, even in the planetarium when I'm doing the shows, when I talk about things, uh, a lot of people get mad at me. But you know, this is this is a scientific fact. This is not the how the world works. Uh, don't worry about that twelve constellations and twelve things that somebody just wrote it up and made it up in the newspaper or uh, your 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 favorite horoscope app. And uh, the, the actual fact is that the signs are in the correct, uh, not in the correct position according to the horoscope writers and you know what the best thing is horoscope writers doesn't know anything about this that's the best part <laughs> I think they do they have to I don't want them People to I don't want them to represent scientifically correct information because that that's like they are done at like <laughs> People have made a living off this event you can't you can't crush them like that for for thousands of years right even even some of the great ancient astronomers. What was the name? Uh, uh, Tycho Brahe. He was he got paid by a whole bunch of royal families to read them their horoscope before he gave us Kepler's laws. Well, in a way, we don't have to get into that. But 
Well, because I'm an astronomer, I've seen a lot of people ask me to, uh, you know, read their like uh, star charts and uh, make predictions about their future. So, <laughs> and I'll, every opportunity, I'm telling you, I'm having, this is not what astronomy is. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is not science. Uh, this is just a belief system. Oh, you can perfectly believe in it. That that's fine. Nobody can say anything about this. That's your freedom. But this is not how science works. Uh, Kurt says, I tried studying constellations, but it's Greek to me. Well, you're right. Uh, well, the, the <laughs> constellation names are coming from Greek. Uh, the, the star names are coming from Arabic language, and the constellation names are coming from uh, Greek words. Why? I mean, they were the first ones to do that. So the first ones, the, the Arabic astronomers uh, thought about naming the stars. So they made star catalogs, and of course, they used Arabic words to name the stars. And same with the constellations. The constellations didn't exist at that time as the address system. So the, the astronomers realized, hey, uh, to be able to communicate about the whereabouts of the objects in the sky, we need an address system. And here are the constellations. And the Greek astronomers did it. Of course, the words are coming from Greek. And I just want to let you know, Kurt, I am 100% stealing that joke. It is, it is added to my compendium of ridiculous jokes in the planetarium. Hey, you need to give proper credit, okay? Probably not going to credit you, Kurt. I'm sorry. <laughs> Patricia, if somebody asks, I'll let them know. Patricia says, how uh, old is the oldest star? So that's going into the, the cosmology and we are trying to find out because if we can find out exactly how old is the oldest star, then we will have a great idea of how old is the universe. So probably the first stars came up shortly after the, the beginning of the universe. Currently we are estimating 13 and a half billion years ago. Uh, and again, as we access to the more modern telescopes, um, we are uh, trying to find more precise numbers. And Brexton, how often do we get falling stars? Well, uh, pretty much actually all the time. Uh, but the, the, the reason we don't see a lot of, of them is depending on a lot of things. So first, we have uh, the, the health of, almost half of the, the 24 hours is daytime. So during daytime, we wouldn't see um, falling stars or shooting stars or meteors, uh, you name it, uh, because the sky is too bright. Second, if it's nighttime, uh, the, the, our, uh, the area in the sky we are seeing is very limited. If there is a sky event going on, uh, let's say a couple hundred uh, miles away, we wouldn't see it unless it is too bright. So mo this is most of them. Uh, the asteroids are all the time coming from space. Most of them uh, are falling onto sea and oceans. Why? Because 75% of the Earth is covered by water. So 75% of the chance they are going to end up in a sea, in a water. So um, what's the percentage of the, the remaining land is a civilized area so people can look up. Uh, and also we need to subtract from that percentage the, 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 the large urban cities like Dallas, Fort Worth area. Sky is too lit, we wouldn't see. So do you see how small chances finding one of those falling in the sky? So, I mean, they are not that big actually. They are li little marble-sized objects falling from sky make the, the meteor or shooting stars. Uh, but yes, they are coming all the time. So it, it is estimated that um, it is about 30 tons of weight is coming from space every day from these asteroids. 30 tons. So that's about two 18-wheeler load of uh, weight coming on Earth. Of course, nothing uh, in the consideration of the, the weight of Earth itself. So just in case uh, you also wanted uh, Brexton to know when you might see the next falling star, uh, it looks like we're going to have uh, the Lyrids up in mid-April. That's probably going to be the next time you're going to get a good chance to, to go out and look and have a, a much higher chance to see one. As it should have a pretty, sh pretty good show. Also, I, th I think that uh, we're going to be in like a quarter phase moon, so you might have a good view of this guy. It means it'll set pretty quickly. 
Yeah, the moon makes a lot of difference too because when it's full moon, the sky is too bright and it actually uh, uh, makes things uh, impossible to see. All right, so what else? The, are we searching for oceans for these pieces of asteroids? No, um, well, the most of them are uh, marble size uh, and they are just completely burning in the sky before they fall off. They fall off as in the form of ashes. If they are slightly, let's say, a basketball size, uh, there's a chance that uh, the small parts may end up uh, on the ground. Uh, so if it's in the water, so it will be there will be no chance to, to find it. Uh, uh, and we can only find it if it makes it to the ground. And, and it is even hard because you don't know where exactly it fell. Uh, and this is an asteroid, found an asteroid. This is pretty heavy, by the way. And uh, the only way uh, we can tell that it's, it came from space, so if we find it, and it looks like a different rock, but it doesn't uh, tell me anything. So the scientists are looking for the chemical composition. If it looks like Earth, that belongs to Earth. If it looks like Mars, then it probably came from Mars. It may look like from the Moon, and it, we say it came from the Moon. So that's how we determine the, um, the type of asteroids. All right, so uh, what else, Jim? Yes, uh, we have something interesting to bring up to you. Um, we kind of talked about uh, mentioning news, so let's go ahead and, and do that real quick. I'm going to pop in here. Uh, oh, my camera shouldn't be here, I don't think. Anyway, Bye we have ice. a great article, very interesting. Please ignore the ads uh, that I saw. And I'm curious what you think about this, Levent, um, at least what your opinion is on this. So I saw this, Russia and China just agreed to build a research station on the moon together. What's your, what's your first take before we go further <sighs> into it? Well, uh, I, it's certainly possible to send some um, uh, robot and even the build uh, the research station if you wish. Uh, my uh, question would be what are you going to do the research on and what is going to be the benefit of putting it on the moon? Because uh, b there are research stations in space like the, the International Space Station is a great laboratory and uh, most of the time scientists are using the space station for conducting research because this is a non-gravity environment. So I don't know what kind of research they are planning to do, but um, it's not a big deal. Okay, so my favorite part of this, I don't, I don't need to read too much to you about it, mostly because uh, people always say they're going to the moon. I, you know, the, the US is going to the moon, Russia's going to the moon, China's going to the moon, now they're going to the moon together. Um, my favorite takeaway from this whole headline was further down and deeper into the article, and I read the article from some other websites as well, um, they just kind of brushed over the fact that, oh yeah, we could do the, uh, on the ground um, base, or we maybe we'll do an in-orbit one. And I just feel like an in-orbit science base is just another satellite of the moon, which there are already a, you know, several. It seemed like a, a quick cop-out, like, ah, yeah, we might spend money on it. I don't know, though. Well, everything it depends on the money. And uh, my actually uh, the feeling is uh, there are more important things in the Mars and Jupiter. And especially uh, there is another uh, destination that we'll be exploring in the future, hopefully. Uh, one of the Saturn's moon, Enceladus. So because the, the NASA identified last year the, 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 the moon of Saturn, Enceladus, as the most likely habitable place beyond Earth in the solar system. So that's going to be a very interesting thing to look at. But currently, we don't have any planned missions. Uh, but we can just quickly develop and make something. Um, what am I looking at here, Jim? OK, right beforehand, uh, Kurt just had a question. The moon should have a lot more asteroid debris because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere to burn them up, right? The moon should have a lot more asteroid debris because the moon doesn't have atmosphere to burn them up. Correct, yes. And, you know, this is actually the um, uh, uh, one of the great uh, the, the, the question in the, um, uh, the PhD examination I've seen, like, 
uh, which side of the moon have more uh, craters? Uh, and, and the answer is the, the back side of the moon have more craters because it prones to the, the asteroid impacts more as the Earth facing side is facing Earth all the time. So the asteroids are not going to come in between and make a U-turn to hit the moon. So uh, most of the craters uh, on the, uh, the Earth facing side are coming from uh, the earlier time of the, the, the moon. Uh, in the solar system, but the other side is full of impact craters and ge is getting more and more every day. And as you said, yes, there is no process on the moon to burn them up. All right, so this picture, just to tell you what we're looking at here, I'll move my face out of the way momentarily. Um, this, this was a really cool article that was written on lunar activity. So uh, by looking at the moon, because it has no atmosphere, like, like you brought up, Kurt, when something hits the moon, it leaves a mark. And because there's no atmosphere, no air, there's no erosion, there's no weather. If you put a footprint on the moon, like the, the um, Apollo astronauts, their footprints are still there. Um, that also means that if, let's just say there was a lava flow, which is what we're looking at in this picture, this is a relatively recent lava flow, the most recent one they think there is. It's hard to date these things. If there's a lava flow, it will stay there untouched until it's hit by uh, uh, an asteroid or stepped on by a footprint or something. Um, but scientists, using some of the data of what we know of how often impacts happen, they've kind of mapped out probably how old this is. And this is a new thing showing that the most recent volcanic activity on the moon is only about 100 million years old, which uh, was a little jarring for some people, but it's also entirely possible. There's not a lot of data on it yet that um, Maybe we're calculating it a little wrong. It's, it's crazy to imagine that the moon would still be hot, I mean, internally, uh, 100 million years ago. That's really recent. Uh, the Br Brexton is asking, if, are there any more pictures of Mars coming? So uh, why don't you show the recent uh, Mars picture? Uh, so that, that was amazing. So uh, one of the first pictures of uh, the Mars, the Perseverance Mars lander, uh, which started operating just a few weeks ago, amazing, and sending uh, very nice, colorful pictures. Uh, showed uh, another great, uh, like the Mars terrain in great detail. So here is uh, the, the picture of the wheel. If you haven't seen this, it, it's been on the, the social media a lot. But um, if you haven't seen that, uh, that's, a, that's a great picture. Uh, yeah, here it is, the, the wheel. So uh, you may ask, like, like, why the wheel is covering the almost the entire picture? This is called hazard camera, Hascam. So hazard cameras are uh, designed to find out if there is anything wrong with the wheel or if, if there is anything dangerous coming up to the wheel. So uh, that's why you see the, the big portion covered by the wheel itself. But here is an important thing. If you look at these rocks, they look like a sponge. They have holes on it. So those holes are telling us we only see that type of rock on Earth if the rocks are buried to water. So here is another just a solid evidence that these rocks were underwater at one point, uh, so the, before Mars got dry. So um, that was a great picture from uh, the, the Perseverance rover. There are many more pictures, especially like nice terrain pictures. You can see just visit NASA website and you can find plenty of uh, media. Yeah, I, th I think that they've released like 7,000 images already. Um, they're all raw data. They're, I think we mentioned it last week, but they're encouraging citizen science. Uh, so download the images, look at them. You may, you may be the first to discover something that they haven't seen yet. It's pretty fantastic. Yeah, if you uh, remember from the, our Mariner videos, uh, the spacecrafts back in uh, 60s uh, designed uh, to also send pictures digitally to Earth. And they were, it was taking like a, almost like more than eight hours per picture. And their pictures were in very low resolution, very small pictures, black and white pictures. So uh, they ended up taking like total of uh, 20, 25 picture per mission. And it was taking months to transfer everything to Earth from the spacecraft. 
uh, now, now it now is taking 7,000 probably <laughs> over the course of two weeks. I mean, th that's why we just started seeing uh, more colorful pictures uh, from the spacecrafts because even like the, the ones that were um, landed in 90s, the late, late 90s and early 2000s, pictures were still coming black and white because they take less space and, uh, and imagine you need to transmit from an antenna located on Mars to all the way to Earth. So that's a big deal. And the, yeah, the they had to do like color correction, right? They, they brought a color wheel on board yeah. that they could take a picture of and fix the colors to it. Yes, so there was a lot of image processing. Um, would like to control the rover for a bit. Well, uh, you can always contact NASA and ask for it. So I don't know if they would let you to do that. They, they wouldn't let me, I know, uh, but uh, who knows? Maybe you can just turn into a nice guy and Actually, say, hey, it, just it take a ride. Might not be fun, Brexton. Uh, you want to know the speed of the rover? This is pretty ridiculous. The speed of uh, Curiosity, um, max speed that they drive it, is 0 0.001 miles per hour. Yeah. It's nice and fast. I think that... Uh, Perseverance can go quite a bit faster. I don't. I don't remember how much, but it can. It can really move. But they haven't turned on its auto. It has a autonomous driving feature, mm -hmm. and it knows it, it like can move out of the way of stuff. Um, they have been a little bit too weary to turn it on just yet. So it's still yeah. going at like 0 .001 miles per hour. Kurt <laughs> brings an interesting point. Uh, do they colorize the sky in Mars rover photos? I heard the sky is black even a uh, day because the the lack of atmosphere. So, um, well, I don't think they need to colorize uh, in, in today's uh, cams because they were like highly detailed pictures. But um, uh, first, uh, there is uh, there is an atmosphere on Mars. It's a thinner atmosphere, thinner air, uh, but there is. Uh, the second, uh, the colorization was done uh, with the one of the, the Mariner spacecraft. Uh, so there's a, like a the Mars sunset picture, but because the camera's uh, light capability was so low, uh, I think, uh, so they, they, they just um, uh, represented the, the color of the sky with a false and fake color. So, uh, and I think, uh, that and that didn't represent the actual sky, but the, uh, the, the, in the actual uh, sky of Mars, it's it's not uh, always black it may in, in the dark time it is black but in the daytime it is pretty much like earth and it has a thin atmosphere and uh, from the pictures i can tell it's uh, like it has a copper like color especially during sunset it's not a blue sky yeah all right so i think they actually get a little bit of a bluish sunset and then the the regular day sky is it's kind of mm -hmm. pinkish red, which you can kind of see in this image. But yeah, we we see that kind of color changes during sunset on Earth too. De it depends on like the, the you know the light pollution is one factor of the the sunset's sky color, and uh, the sky is considered always polluted on Mars surface because there is a lot of dust storms, and the one the dust becomes airborne it is changing the, the color of the sunlight and the color of the sky eventually. All right, so um, if you don't have any more questions, I think uh, we were able to answer most of the questions and there is not going to be a live stream next week because it's uh, spring break and uh, the university is going to be um, taking a little time for closure. So in the meantime, we are not going to be uh, away from work. We are going to be uh, preparing um, more content and pre preparing for more streams. But certainly, uh, we'll like to see you in two weeks. All right, hope to uh, see you and stay safe. Thank you.